I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker today, Dr. Rasmus Nielsen, who is the Director of Research at Oxford's uh, Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. And he also serves as Editor-in-Chief for the International Journal of Press Politics. His work focuses on the changes in the news media, on political communication, and the role of technology that it plays in both. He's done extensive research on journalism and American politics, as well as various forms of activism. He's received many awards throughout his career and has a PhD in communication from Columbia University. He will be sharing some research that he's done uh, globally on the use of or the use of journalism and social media and how it's consumed on digital media. That'll be a 20-minute presentation. We'll then ask Erica Anderson, our very own, who heads up the partnerships team in the News Lab, based out of New York as well, uh, to do a QA. and um, I learned a lot about Erica along the way as well. Um, her current role is working with partnerships in the news industry and seeing how we can really broadcast uh, and advance storytelling, um, building trust in this digital age with the news industry. Prior to Google, she was uh, Kitty Couric's first social media person, uh, helping establish Kitty Couric as the first journalist to really lead the way in social media. And prior to that, she was at Twitter helping establish the program with journalists. Um, fun fact, um, helping build long codes so that journalists can tweet uh, from remote regions in war, zone, war zones um, using some satellite phones. Uh, such esteemed speakers that we have today, uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Rasmus Nielsen and Erica Anderson. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much for the warm introduction and for the opportunity to speak uh, here today. Uh, I will talk on the basis of a large collaborative research project that uh, we do at the Reuters Institute at the University of Oxford that's led up by my colleague uh, Nick Newman, uh, Richard Fletcher, Antonis Kalagoropoulos, David Levy, uh, and myself. So I will sort of speak on behalf of what really is a team effort. Uh, and I'm just the one who has the, um, the honor, if you will, to stand here in front of you to talk about these issues. What I want to do is to give a big picture overview uh, what's uh, happening to how people use media, how they use news, how they get it across a range of different countries across the world. I'll touch on some key themes uh, around these issues and try to take away some of the big picture points that I think are relevant for thinking about the role of journalism in our societies, but also the role of large technology companies like Google. So um, first, uh, a quick overview of what the study is about. Uh, we do a large survey every year. Uh, and this uh, year, we have covered 36 different markets across the world, a total of 70,000 respondents, more than 2,000 in every country that we cover, to really give a picture globally of how people are using uh, media and news uh, across the world. This is made possible by a network of partners and sponsors, including a range of different media organizations like the BBC, media regulators like Ofcom in the UK, uh, private sector media companies, uh, including publishers, newspapers, and the like universities and technology companies like Google, who is amongst uh, the sponsors behind this collaborative effort. I want to touch on a, a set of sort of key findings from this uh, survey uh, today before we open up for conversation with, uh, with Erica, and I'll run through each of them in turn. The first point I want to talk about is the move towards an environment of what we might think of as distributed discovery, where people increasingly get their news not by going direct to the websites and apps of news organizations, but by coming sideways via search, via social, and increasingly via messaging apps or other forms of uh, distributed discovery, where contrary to fears of filter bubbles, at least in our research, we find that people, in fact, are increased to more, exposed to more different sources of news than they were in the past, but also an environment in which people don't always recognize the brands or the sources of news that they have, in fact, used. The second point I want to cover is the question of trust. And I will argue that our research shows that confidence in both in social media and in news media is low in many environments, in particular in those that are politically polarized, like uh, the US, 
Uh, I will talk about the evolving role of platform companies like Google in terms of how the way in which we as users use the technologies that companies like Google, Facebook, and Apple, and others are offering is changing uh, the way in which we get news. Um, and finally, I will uh, talk about mobile and the centrality of the smartphone as the defining device of news today, and if you will, the implications of these developments for the business of journalism. So this is the terrain. The first topic is the question of distributed environments. Now, it's clear that in the early days of the internet, we still lived in a world in which people primarily got news by going direct to a source of news, a brand that they knew. They would type in the New York Times.com or uh, still maybe use a print newspaper or go to a broadcaster for, for their news. But increasingly, the world in which we live is one in which people have embraced what we might think of as distributed discovery, where we come across news via platform services that are sometimes used because we want news, but sometimes incidentally expose us to news while we are using the platform or service for other purposes. Uh, in our survey by now, most people would say that they get news in a range of different ways, sometimes going direct, sometimes using social or search. But when we do a follow-up question of asking people, what is your main way of getting news online, we clearly see this shift towards an environment that is more distributed. So by now, in the countries we cover, the 36 different markets, about a third say that going direct to a news provider is their main way of getting news online, but two thirds mention various forms of distributed access, search most importantly, social close behind, and then other forms of sideways access. Amongst younger users, those under 35, it's three quarters who, main, who name these distributed forms of access as their main way of getting news. Um, Many people have worried that this development would lead us towards an environment characterized by filter bubbles or echo chambers where algorithmic selection would lead us just to feed us more of what we already want. In fact, when we look at our survey data, what we find consistently across the markets that we look at is that those people who use social media or search or both amongst the ways in which they find news are consistently exposed to more different sources of news in the course of a week than those who don't. Now, it's important to say here that, of course, for those people who use a lot of news, this effect may be quite marginal. So if you use maybe five or seven different sources of news in a week, you're probably not going to see more different sources of news via search and social. But what's important to remember is that most people do not use a lot of sources of news. They may use two or three that they go to directly, and search and social in general will add additional sources that, that they would not have come across otherwise. So we really don't find these filter bubbles or record chambers. In fact, we find the opposite incidental exposure to news that people would not have sought out otherwise, in particular for young people and for those least interested in news. The flip side of this, which we could broadly say is probably a good thing, if you will, is that there is a clear issue of uh, brand recognition in this environment, that people don't always remember or even recognize the news providers that they come across via search or social. So uh, this year in the UK, we did sort of a close study, particularly this question of attribution, where we tracked piece of people passively, looking at what they actually accessed, a set of panelists who had volunteered to let their behavior be tracked. Um, we identified the ways in which people came across news by going direct, by accessing first a social media domain and then a news site, or using search and then accessing a news site. And then we would survey those people within 48 hours, knowing that they had accessed a certain news story, and ask them, do you remember where you got it? What news brand did you get this story from? Unsurprisingly, most of the people who had directly accessed the news organization would correctly recall what news organization this was, the BBC, the Mail Online, the Guardian, whereas less than half of those who had come across this story via search or social could correctly remember and recall what the brand behind it was actually like. So here is a real issue that is in part, if you will, an issue for publishers around uh, their business and the, the standing of their journalism, but also is a public issue in the sense that we know from a lot of research that brands are key to the ways in which people think about the credibility of information and the trustworthiness of information and the degree to which they will let that information influence or inform their views, if you will. So there is an issue here of whether in distributed environments um, we are helped enough as users to actually navigate the information that we discover via these search uh, and social services. The next topic I want to uh, touch on is this question of confidence and trust, which is sort of follows on, if you will, in some ways from this question of distributed discovery and whether we recognize brands in that environment. Um, the first thing I want to say here is that uh, 
we asked people in the survey a sort of a simple top line question of whether they felt that different ways of getting news helped them distinguish between fact and fiction. So it was sort of a way of trying to get at this issue of fake news that didn't rely on simply asking people, so Rasmus, do you feel like you've been fooled recently? And then me sort of volunteering, yes, I've been fooled all the time. No, instead we, we asked people whether they felt empowered by different forms of media to distinguish between fact and fiction. Now, um, the first figure there is quite striking, we feel, is that only a quarter of our respondents, 24%, feel that social media helps them distinguish between fact and fiction. Now, obviously, this has never been a promise that social media made. It is not something that social media platforms have promised people to help them do this. Uh, but it is still quite striking that when we know that so many people rely on social media as one among several sources of uh, ways of finding news, that so few people seem to think that this is actually a good way for them to distinguish between fact and fiction. The optimistic spin on this, if you will, is that people are actually quite skeptical of this information. And this image that some people have of people sort of naively believing every piece of information that they come across on Twitter or on Facebook is not one we can recognize at all. To the contrary, our data suggests that people are highly skeptical and quite critical consumers of information that they find in distributed environments. Um, when we turn to news media, um, the figure is much higher. 40% say that they feel news media help them distinguish between fact and fiction. Whether the figure is as high as journalists would like it to be is then a separate question, because of course here journalists actually do believe that this is what they are trying to do in many cases. So the figure here, if you will, is one I think that indicates that there is a much broader issue of trust and confidence in news media that um, I think has been illustrated quite vividly recently in the United States around elections and the, uh, if you will, the attitudes of certain politicians and parts of the public towards journalists and media organizations. But it's important to see here that this, while a global phenomenon, is not equally pronounced or, or the same level, if you will, of distrust or even crisis of confidence in every country around the world. So looking across the 36 markets we cover in the report, um, we find very pronounced differences in degree to which people say that they can trust the media. Some countries, often in Northern Europe, have half or close to half the population saying they have a lot or quite a lot of confidence in the news media. Whereas in countries like the US, it's less than 40%. And many very polarized countries in Southern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and Latin America have even lower levels of trust like that, like Greece, for example, and Korea, where only about a quarter of the population feel that they can trust the media. Now, a subset of this is a follow-up question about whether people trust not the media, but my media, if you will, the media that they use. And in polarized societies like the US, we see very big differences where people are much more likely to say that they trust the media that they use than they are to say that they trust the media in general, implicitly the media that other people use. Whereas in many of the countries with high levels of trust, people trust both their own media and the media that other people use, which is, a, if you will, a slightly different environment. In our view, this is in large part due to political polarization, so something that may be accentuated by media and by technology, but is fundamentally a political question. We try to map this by sort of showing the degree to which audiences are distributed along partisan political lines in the online environment. And you can see, for example, in a country like the United States that you have a majority of brands that have an audience that leans to the left. I should underline here, this graph is about the audience's political leaning, not about the content or editorial line of these organizations, but a large number of brands who have left-leaning audiences, and then a few who have right-leaning audiences, and very little in the middle, apart from Yahoo News. Contra a country like the UK, where you have a large provider in the middle, the public service media organization, the BBC, um, a number of newspapers that are sort of clearly center left or center right, whether it's the Mail Online, the Telegraph, or the Guardian, and the Daily Mirror, and then very small, very purely partisan outlets on the far left and the far right. So this is a quite a different picture, if you will, of what an online media environment, a high choice media environment, might look like in a country that is less politically polarized than the US, and where people have, and generally have higher levels of confidence in the media, though declining perhaps after Brexit. Now, the next topic I wanted to quickly walk through is this question of the evolving role of platform companies in how we find and access news and the way in which these things are changing over time. Um, the first point here is really, of course, to highlight the centrality of social media. Uh, by now, the only sort of other way, apart from search, that, that really is central to distributed discovery. Um, and we've seen an incredibly erratic, uh, rapid rise in, in the role of social media for getting news. By now, in 2017, it's more than half of our US respondents say that they get news on social media. It's basically a doubling in just four years. 
um, the development in the UK is, is very similar. But what's important to uh, recognize here also is that actually this year we've seen, if you will, a slowing down or even a flatlining of this seemingly in, inexorable growth of the roles of social media. So in many countries, the number of people who say they get news from social media has stayed flat or even declined slightly year on year. And again, there are very pronounced country to country differences between a country like Germany versus a country like Spain, where uh, in Spain that twice as many people say they get news on social media. So social media, perhaps a saturation point, the same way that search may have reached saturation as one of the ways in which people get uh, news. Uh, where do we see the evolution then? Well, uh, from our point of view, the next frontier is probably messaging applications. This is where we've seen real growth uh, year on year particular WhatsApp, uh, Facebook Messenger, but also in some countries, individual uh, uh, other providers. So we have Snapchat that are important for some demographics, younger users uh, in many countries, particularly the US uh, and some other English speaking markets. But also in some countries, there are individual uh, messaging applications that are very important, Kakao in Korea, for example, online in Japan. So we see a lot of difference here in the role of messaging apps, these more private environments that are not filtered by algorithms making display decisions, but are filtered by users deciding who they want to share with, that in some markets are really, really important. Already now, we have in some markets, generally markets with low levels of trust in mainstream media and with highly polarized environments where you may not want to talk about politics publicly on social media, but may want to talk about politics privately with people you trust. We see countries that in some cases like Malaysia and Brazil, it's half or close to half of the population say that they get news via messaging apps. This is really is a new frontier that publishers are interested in looking at, but also, of course, a whole new set of questions around the spread of information and all the wonderful ways in which this can empower people to share things and get informed, but also, of course, the fears around misinformation and an environment in which it's much harder to really track what kind of people, information do people actually get in these environments that are not public and not transparent from the outside. The next frontier, perhaps, might be voice. Uh, many companies are investing in this, Amazon and Google included, and many publishers are interested in this question of whether voice provides a new interface, whether it's via smart speakers or, or also via smartphones, and increasingly are offering not only responses to voice queries, but also a voice response to the query, if you will, in terms of giving people the news uh, via these uh, devices. And we expect to see some growth in this area. Moving forward, this is clearly a priority for technology companies, and publishers may be able to leverage this growth. The fourth issue I wanted to um, talk about is mobile. Um, really, the mobile phone, our data suggests increasingly is the defining device of digital news. And again, a bit like the growth of social media, it's in development that I think by now is so naturalized for, for many people who might be in this room or listening to this talk, we take it for granted because for us, the mobile phone is already the remote control to much of our life and our digital life. But I think it's worth remembering just how incredibly rapid this growth has been, how quickly this has transformed the environment for publishers and for a lot of people who didn't necessarily grow up with a smartphone sort of, sort of glued to their ear. We see a rapid shift where uh, this year for the first time we reached sort of a tipping point where the same number of people in the US identify their smartphone as their main device for getting digital news as uh, identify a personal computer. And again, just look at the pace of development here uh, in just three years, as a move from uh, a situation in which less than a fifth would say the smartphone was their main device for getting digital news to a situation in which 40% uh, of the respondents, and if you include tablets, well over, uh, 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 over half of the respondents say that their mobile device is their main way of getting news. Uh, so this is a very rapid development. And of course, it creates a new environment where we start accessing news and all, uh, news and all these sort of found time, these little pockets of time throughout our day that previously weren't necessarily connected with media use. We all recognize the experience of waiting for a friend at a cafe. We flick, up, flick out the phone. Sitting in a at the back of a cab, we flick up, flip out the phone. Waiting for the subway, flip out the phone. And there are all these, if you will, new moments early in the morning, even before we get out of bed, uh, tending to other private needs, um, or for that matter, um, using public transportation, where there are these new moments where people can access media content in ways that were almost unimaginable, if you will, just a few years ago, where we were still tied to devices that were largely desk bound or using print and broadcast in quite traditional ways. And this is a new situation full of opportunities for platform companies and for publishers alike. And of course, also one where increasingly we are all competing for attention 
uh, precious, precious attention of getting onto the lock screen of these supercomputers we increasingly all carry in our pockets. So head-to-head -head competition for attention. Um, publishers are pushing back here. Publishers who may have felt that they were in a zero-sum game between platforms and publishers are in some markets by now really leveraging this mobile opportunity to get their alerts onto the lock screen of smartphones. We see a resurgent interest in mobile apps. We see uh, mobile alerts. We see email newsletters. We see different ways in which publishers are really uh, fighting back to capture a share of people's attention in part by leveraging this mobile opportunity. But again, of course, this is also linked to the rise of platforms in the sense that we know from our research that people who use mobile are also more likely to use social media and search to get news, even controlling for other factors. So the rise of mobile and the rise of platforms here is interlinked. And though publishers are fighting back, it is clear that platform companies have often been the best at serving the mobile user and better than publishers in many cases and for many uh, problems. This leads me to the question of the business uh, of journalism. Um, and I think in some ways, this is where things get a little bit trickier in the sense that in many ways, the world that we are describing with our research and our data is a wonderful world in many ways, much better than the one I grew up in where multi sort of uh, media diversity meant you know, a couple of different print newspapers and a couple of different broadcast channels. This is a much better world from my point of view as a user. I have access to more different sources of information than ever before. They are generally free at the point of consumption. I can find them in many more ways. They are more conveniently available through my mobile phone than they ever were in the past. This is great. And it's even a world in which, contrary to fear of filter bubbles and the like, we actually find that many people are exposed to much more news than they would seek out of their own volition. But there is a catch. Uh, which is the question of the funding of this news, the professional production of journalism. And it is worth keeping in mind here that when we look at who invests in professional news production, which warts and all, nothing is perfect, uh, we know from a lot of research, helps people be more informed about public life, help people be more engaged with local communities, help people take part in the political process. So again, news is not perfect. News is very far from perfect. But we know from lots of research it has positive civic and political consequences when people actually engage with professionally produced journalism. And that the existence of such journalism, again, with all its imperfections, demonstrably help hold power to account, reduce corruption and the like in countries around the world and communities around the world. Who invests in this journalism? Well, in this country, even today, uh, that skipped one slide, um, about 60% uh, of investment in professionally produced journalism, if we go by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, employment of re reporters and correspondents, comes from print publishers newspaper organizations who still generally make 80 or 90 percent of their revenues from their offline operations that are in steep decline and who are investing ambitiously in their digital operations and are reaching significant audiences there but are facing difficulties in getting a, a return on that investment and generating a profit from their digital investments. So news is still primarily funded by newspaper publishers with their digital operations but much of the revenue coming from legacy operations in print and online media information is a much smaller part of this, though of course it is a much larger share of people's attention and of the advertising market increasingly. The funding, well, historically, uh, the funding in the United States in particular came from advertising. Newspaper publishers historically made something like 80 or even 90 percent of their revenues from advertising. That advertising now increasingly goes to digital media. This is a well-known story. Uh, American newspapers used to make something like 60 billion dollars a year in print advertising. Now it's more like 20. Um, and digital, of course, has grown very, very rapidly. When, when it comes to digital advertising, they are competing head to head with very, very successful companies like Google. So when we look at the share of digital advertising globally, these are estimates of the share captured by two large platform companies. Blue at the bottom of Google is Google. Uh, the um, um, pinkish color is Facebook. And then the orange part at the top, about half of the pie, is what everybody else in the world competes for in terms of digital advertising. So advertising alone has been a very tough business proposition for the professional production of journalism, which could be quite expensive, and where the um, average revenues per user for the digital operations have been quite low, and advertising has been tough to get to generate the kind of revenues that publishers had been hoping for and that they have been generated in the past. Um, so many have turned to pay. We find in our survey that 13% of our respondents across 36 markets say that they pay in some form for news online, uh, highest in the Nordic countries in Europe, lower in a country like the UK where I live currently. Um, and in this country, in the US, we've seen evidence of what we think of as sort of a Trump bump, if you will, 
uh, where a number of publishers have seen a real increase in the number of people who've been willing to pay for their journalism, perhaps in part because of this more polarized political environment where there's been attacks on the value of journalism, but also a certain rallying, if you will, around the importance of journalistic organizations as part of the functioning democracy. And we've seen individual titles, whether the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, or the New York Times, reportedly benefiting from this. And we see, again, in the survey, a clear upwards tick in, who pay, in the number of people who pays for news. Now, while it is a challenging environment for publishers, I think there is no question that there is also opportunities ahead. And I think one of the opportunities ahead is really is this, if you will, increasing evidence that if you do really good journalism that really connects with the problems that people actually have, the concerns that they actually care about, and if you are able to serve it to them in a way that is convenient, uh, um, whether that is via platform companies or through your own apps and, and websites or some combination thereof, you can not only monetize that attention through advertising and other auxiliary revenues, but also increasingly convince people that this is actually worth paying for. This has value that I will pay you know, honest dollars for. Uh, and importantly, it is not only those who already pay for print. It's not only older people who are willing to pay. So when we break down the pay behavior by age, Contrary to this idea that some older sort of commentators on the digital media environment may, um, may the comments they may make sometimes, it's not a question of sort of millennials, quote unquote, to be to blame for all this stuff. In fact, we find that younger people are more likely to say that they're paying for news uh, online. Uh, probably in large part, at least we would argue, because they don't have a reference price of zero. Unlike old people like myself, um, who have grown up in a world in which everything online was free, and I'm sort of mildly offended whenever anyone wants to charge me for something online. I have sort of to get to used to that idea that I have to pay for things online just as I have to pay for things elsewhere if I want something premium. Um, younger people who are younger than me have grown up in an environment where they've been used to paying for things online, in particular on their phone, from the get-go, whether these are music services like Spotify, uh, premium video and entertainment like Netflix, uh, or for that matter, uh, mobile applications and games online. And in that context, it is no longer sort of shocking or scandalous to suggest that if you want a premium news product, you may actually have to pay for it. And in fact, we have, again, evidence here that young people are no less likely than older people to pay for news. And I think this is, if you will, an opportunity, uh, a business opportunity to say to publishers that not only is it the case today that the best journalism is better than it's ever been, and also from a user point of view, more easier to access, easier to find, more convenient. Um, it's also something that at least a part of the population, primarily more affluent uh, and privileged news lovers, so there are issues of social inequality here, but that at least some people find is actually worth paying for. Okay, key questions, and I'll uh, leave these uh, on the, um, uh, on the slides before um, we kick off the discussion with Erica. But from my point of view, I suppose some of the key questions that we are left with uh, with this research is, First, the question um, of whether we can help more effectively as researchers, as platform companies, as publishers, can help people more effectively navigate this distributed environment that is so rich, but also so confusing in some cases and full of pitfalls. It's a question of whether publishers and platforms can help restore trust and credibility in news and information, I think is another issue where there might be space for shared action. It is a question of whether publishers and platforms who have coexisted sometimes fractiously for some quite some time now, have learned enough from that history of collaboration and occasional confrontations to uh, find a more mutually satisfactory settlement for coexistence in the future as we move towards these new forms of platform services, whether messaging apps or voice operated systems, or for that matter, virtual reality, whether we've learned enough from the past to find a better settlement for the future that works for publishers, for platforms, and for the public too. Um, there is a question about publishers too, about whether they are sufficiently uh, ambitiously embracing the opportunities of this environment or whether they are sometimes, if you will, um, captured by the glory of their past rather than the promise of their uh, future. Uh, and finally, of course, this question of money. Who's going to pay? Um, and I hope uh, we can get to grips with those questions today. So I look forward to the discussion with Erica. Thank you very much. Thank you. Testing. All right. Um, Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I'm sure everyone in the audience agrees. I, let's just take a step back. Um, so this is the sixth year that Reuters Institute has done the study. 
This is the biggest one by far, 36 countries. I think you interviewed 70,000 people, both quantitative and qualitative research. Mm -hmm. Like, zoom out for us. What was perhaps most interesting or out of character for this report that you saw compared to the five before? Um, I think in some ways it's uh, this year with the expansion of the number of countries we were covering, um, I think the the most important findings are not always surprising, if you will, and I try to cover some of them today. But I think some of the ones that were revelatory for us and really interesting are really about the international comparisons. Um, I believe very firmly that just the same way as uh, news organizations and tech companies elsewhere can learn from what happens in a country like the United States, so too people here can learn from what's going on elsewhere in the world. And I would highlight two examples. One is that. Um, Journalists in this country and commentators in this country might feel that um, an environment characterized by um, political polarization, low trust in political institutions and the media, um, and media organizations with limited newsrooms and often shrinking newsrooms is sort of a shocking and new situation in the US. I have colleagues from Italy and from Greece who would say, you know, welcome to the club. This is nothing new. Uh, and I think there is a real idea there, if you will, that we can sort of use data like this to start a conversation about how um, publishers uh, and platforms, for that matter, in a country like this can learn from the experience of people elsewhere who have long tried to have a functioning public debate in an environment that was much more challenging than the U.S. was till not so long ago. The other, I think, surprising finding I would highlight in terms of, uh, of sort of the new things that were new for us uh, in this year's report is I think the, um, and again, it's an example, if you will, of the value of looking at developments elsewhere um, to sort of supplement one's understanding of, of one's own national and local context, is that it's been really interesting to look more closely at Asia Pacific, where I think it's easy to um, overlook for people in North America and Western Europe that many mar markets in Asia Pacific, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, to some extent Japan, South Korea, are, and Singapore for that matter, are technologically ahead in many ways. Higher levels of internet use, higher levels of smartphone use, younger populations who have taken to digital media more quickly uh, than more aging populations, in particular in Europe. And I think it's interesting to note that in these environments where there is no question that platform companies are absolutely central to how people find and access news, it is also clear that not all publishers, but the most successful and aggressive publishers have been able to carve out a role for themselves in that environment, uh, whether this is a tabloid title like Apple Daily in Hong Kong or the Straits Times in Singapore, uh, that there, there are news organizations there that are uh, really, if you will, have been, um, have found um, a space in a, in a truly digital first and mobile first and platform shaped environment that I think many North American and Western European publishers are only beginning to imagine, if you will. So you're optimistic in seeing, in looking at APAC and seeing the collaboration and the yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very optimistic in, in many ways. I think there are very, very real challenges around uh, the question of the business of journalism. And mm -hmm. I think that challenge is one we cannot ignore, that the precondition of professional and necessary but not sufficient precondition for professional autonomous news production is profitability. And if this cannot be achieved, then there is a serious market failure that has profound democratic and public um, implications. But uh, as serious as that challenge is, there is no question that in many other ways the media environment we have today is much uh, better for our abilities as citizens, provided we have the inclination to find and access information than it ever was in the past. Mm -hmm. let's, let's take a step back and talk about trust, which you brought up in, in showing the chart of trust across the 36 countries and the point you made about polarization um, in society le leading to less trust in news. Um, just to quote the, the report, um, less than half the population, 43%, trust the media across all 36 countries surveyed, and almost a third actively avoid the news. That number rises to 38% in the U.S. So for me, the headline there is less trust equals less news. If you don't trust the news, you don't consume it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a, a real um, two problems that are compounding each other, right, when around trust and confidence. One is that this undermines the ability of journalism to play its role in our democracies, it also undermines the ability of the business of news to sustain journalism itself. And this crisis of confidence, I think, in part, in large part, is about politics. Um, journalism primarily covers public institutions. Uh, 
And if those public institutions themselves are deeply riven with conflict and are populated in part by elected officials who not only question the integrity and motives of each other, but also actively campaign against the news uh, itself, this has consequences for people's perception uh, of journalism as well as those public institutions. I think there is also a question in many cases of a disconnect between the content produced by even the best news organizations and the concerns of many individuals, whether these are around issues of inequality and marginalization, where there are many people who understandably do not feel represented by journalism in terms of diversity, of uh, gender, of sexuality, of race and ethnicity, whether it's around class, Increasingly, journalism is basically done by people like me, for people like me, and there is a question about whether uh, a lot of uh, very good, otherwise very good journalism actually confronts the people that people, uh, the, the problems that people feel that they have. And there is a, if you will, sometimes an issue of um, a risk that people will judge the totality of the journalistic profession, the output of the entire media institution, by, if you will, the excesses of the worst. So this perception that because much journalism, or at least some journalism, is about you know, sensationalist coverage of crime, terrorism, celebrity gossip, and the like, then surely all journalism must be like this. And then I don't want to pay attention to it because it's depressing mm -hmm. and irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It, it certainly feels like a, a crisis and one that we've seen for the last 10 years with the changes in, uh, as you said, decentralized distribution. We're no longer getting the newspaper and reading it in the morning um, with a cup of coffee. Maybe some people are, but habits are changing, revenue is changing. Certainly a lot of disruption has occurred on behalf of uh, technology and platforms. But there, is, there are signs of life. I mean, it's interesting. You showed that example about the, the quote unquote Trump bump um, that subscriptions increased, at least for a few national organizations. I mean, talk to me. What did you learn about um, subscriptions and the ways in which that really compelling statistic that young people are willing to pay for news? You, you said earlier there's this reference point. They're willing to pay for Spotify. They're willing to pay for Netflix. They're willing to pay for news. I mean, talk about that if you can. Sure. I mean, I want to uh, stress that. that the situation here is complex and there are real problems and I don't want to sugarcoat any of those problems and those problems are very often around business as well as politics. But I also really want to underline that it really is the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. I'm not a pessimist and I think in many ways, again, the information available and the ways in which we can find this information are vastly superior to the ones uh, that I grew up with. I don't know anyone under 40 who would willingly trade the media environment we live in today for the one that I grew up with and I share that view myself. Um, so it is, a, it is a situation that's characterized by many problems, but not only problems, also huge opportunities. In terms of willingness to pay, I think there is a real um, sort of a question of, uh, of how to manage transition here. Uh, a lot of um, news organizations have, for understandable reasons, but perhaps in retrospect, reasons that were a little bit short-sighted, this is not a criticism of any individual involved, but simply an observation, have have tended to navigate by quite short-term metrics of maximizing page views that in turn were used to sell advertising. Um, if you've done that for 10 or 20 years um, and people have um, formed their view of journalism on the basis of encountering your brand primarily through the lens of things that can uncharitably be called, be called clickbait, then turning around and saying, oh, by the way, you should pay me $20 a month for this is a tough transition to make. Um, and I think there is a quite a profound question that a lot of news organizations um, are really only beginning to seriously ask themselves, which is, what is the problem that we solve? Okay, Not the problem we used to solve, not the problem that our civics teacher in high school would tell us that we're solving, but the problem that we actually solve for actual people in our community. What is that problem? And can we actually solve that in a way that is effectively addressing the people, the, the issues faced by real people out there and also done so in a way that's convenient enough to get their attention and to get them to engage. And it's done in a way that is cost efficient enough that, that one can do it on the basis of, of revenues that will, almost, uh, on, that will almost inevitably be smaller than the ones news organizations had in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. So I want um, anyone in the audience who have questions to start thinking of those and please line up if you have a question. Um, Let's jump over to, let's talk about social media and messaging because one of the findings from the report is actually consumption of news on social media is flattening out in some places, but there's a huge increase. I think last year, 15% increase in people consuming news on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. um, on Facebook Messenger, I think there were 30,000 bots since that started uh, delivering news. So we're beginning to see this transition actually into closed networks. 
into messaging apps for news. Can you talk a little bit about that, what you see as a trend having spent time in Hong Kong, Singapore, in Asia? What can we learn, what can the U.S. or European countries learn from how news is being delivered and consumed through messaging apps? I mean, I think those are all early indications of how, and again, this is more than anything a challenge for the journalistic profession itself and for those, the wider ecosystem of, of, of people who care about it, whether ordinary users or platform companies or researchers like myself, is the question of how do we think about the, the act of journalism itself uh, if we are leaving behind the shackles of how journalism was done in the past, right? A lot of journalism is still primarily produced in the form of an article that is instantly mm -hmm. recognizable as an artifact of print technology. It has the length, it has the look, it is largely dictated by how things were done in the past. It has evolved, but not much. Or the short news clip that was part of a broadcast bulletin, two and a half minute video. There's nothing wrong with these formats. I consume them every day myself, sometimes uh, gladly, sometimes with mild disgruntlement. Um, but I think there is a real question. What do we think about what is the act of journalism or the profession and the practice of journalism? What does it look like beyond the article? What comes off of the article or the news clip? What is the way in which uh, journalism can find a position in that ecosystem, whether it is the mobile experience or this distributed environment, where I think we have to accept that, that for most people, Journalism will be a smaller part of a larger media experience than it was in the past. Um, and I think in some ways this may be tough for the journalistic profession to confront, but if it is a fact, then it's incumbent on the profession to face this fact and then think about how can you solve problems if you have less of people's attention or you have to work harder to get it. And I think that apps are interesting here. I think bots are interesting here. I think rethinking the format, whether there are slideshows or videos, um, and this whole idea uh, that, that increasingly I think some of the most innovative thinkers in the profession, in the industry, are thinking about journalism as a service rather than as a product, mm -hmm. rather than just churning out, frankly, you know, 200 articles a day uh, or video enough for a 30-minute broadcast bulletin that's then, you know, cut up and, and loaded onto social media. What does it look like if you're not, not longer, long, no longer simply pushing out a product but trying to think from the needs of different communities and serving those needs in different ways? Yeah. I'm curious what platforms, you talk a bit about platforms, you know, I, obviously we're here at Google, um, we have a lot of people inside the company working to support journalists and news organizations. Um, what, have, what have platforms done well? What have they not done enough of? I mean, this is a transition, it requires collaboration and working together, but from your perspective and from what the report found, what are your perspectives on this? Um. I think the first thing to say is that different platform companies are different and different publishers have different needs. So there is no one sort of recipe for what this relationship should look like. And there is also, I think, sometimes the, the slight risk that when platforms and publishers start working together that um, the interests of each individual company can sometimes overshadow the interests of the user, the public, if you will. And I think this is a sort of a risk we need to be conscious of. I think there are real issues now that are, are already beginning to be addressed. Google is involved in this, Facebook is involved in this, uh, that are around trust and verification. So uh, how to flag uh, fake or misleading content online, how to try to um, help um, uh, more clearly communicate the brands that whose reputation are behind the content that people might come across. Google has worked on this in the AMP carousel in search results. Facebook has just announced uh, the, the integration of, of, uh, of brands in, in the articles that show up in the news feed to sort of more clearly communicate where the information originates. So there's a whole set of, issue of, of issues around um, helping people navigate this environment, enabling uh, effective use of it. Um, more fundamentally, I suppose that the issues specifically between platforms and publishers have been around editorial control. So. Uh, who makes the decisions about what is displayed where and uh, how can publishers influence those so that they feel that their content is not only discoverable but also discoverable in a context that they um, feel content with. Um, and and this, is a, this has been a very long discussion between Google and publishers as well as between Facebook and, mm -hmm. and publishers. Many people in the room will be aware. Um, going back to Google News uh, and, and Google Search uh, more than uh, uh, many years ago. Um, is around data. Um, so um, there is a, a question of data that is in part about commercial uh, use. How can you, um, can data be shared in a way that doesn't compromise the privacy of users and that enables not only platforms but also publishers to make more informed decisions mm -hmm. about 
their content as well as the advertising and, and other forms of commercial uh, considerations that they have. And then the final one is revenue, right? It's the question of what is a, um, a revenue split that reflects the value being created. And, and again, there's been uh, a lot of discussions around this where um, some companies like Google have been invested in revenue sharing around advertising, but there are publishers who have considerations around this. There are discussions around Facebook around this sort of question of monetization, revenue sharing. And there is the question of whether platforms, in particular uh, platforms in, in the West, have been so committed to an idea of free at the point of consumption that they have made it even harder for publishers to actually start working with subscriptions and micropayments than it needed to be. And here, many publishers in Asia Pacific, for example, would say that companies like WeChat, um, uh, Tencent's, uh, the Tencent in China, their social media platform WeChat, uh, um, um, are ahead of where platform companies are in the West. And actually, the platform companies in the West could learn a lot mm -hmm. from e-commerce and social media in China. Well, good. We're taking notes. Thank you. Um, I, I think that one thing I want to mention, we'll go to this question, is that um, from my perspective on the, on the news lab and working with industry partners and journalists around the world, one of the trends that I'm seeing that I think is really important is utilizing and, and seeking uh, more information algorithm, algorithmically from journalists and developers inside newsrooms about their, the quality of their content. Yep. So a good example is, um, or defining their content mm -hmm. so that we can more strategically um, visualize it to consumers who there's a media literacy gap. Is this an op-ed? Is this an analysis? Is it reporting? So we've launched a local news tag, the fact check tag, and, and you know that's all um, schema, open web markup. And so yeah, I mention it, it's technical, it's, it's in the weeds, but I mention it because there's this theme happening where the platforms are trying to get more information to showcase the quality of the content and to distinguish it. Question. Yeah, um, I thought the point about the echo chamber and filters was interesting about how people are actually seeing content that they're not normally exposed to. Um, I was wondering when you're doing your research, um, how you account for how people report on what they behave versus how they actually behave. Because um, I know a lot of the time people will say that they read certain things, but in actuality they won't. So is there any kind of research techniques that you use to account for that dichotomy? Um, thanks. I think that's your spot on. I mean, that's a key challenge in doing any kind of research in this in particular. Um, for this particular research, we rely on recall. So we have one set of questions that are about asking people to um, name source of news they've used in the last week, where they're prompted with a list of brands. Uh, so that's where we know the number of sources they've used. And then a separate set of questions that are around the ways in which people say they come across news. So for this particular analysis of incidental exposure, um, the figures both for those who use social media and those who don't are equally susceptible to that problem of recall-based use, if you will. So it shouldn't disproportionately affect either one of them. The problem is real in the sense most people um, uh, don't recall everything they've done and don't report everything they've done accurately either. So there is a real problem of recall versus behavior. Um, but in this particular case, it should influence both sides of that equation. Now, a follow-up piece of research we did that was based on actual behavioral data rather than self-reported data is the deep dive I mentioned around attribution. In that case, we passively tracked a panel uh, of, um, I believe we had about 6,000 uh, with, working with a partner company, YouGov, in, in the UK, about 6,000 people in the UK for a month. So in that case, we had behavioral data. We knew what they had accessed and we could count up the number of different sites they had uh, accessed. Um, we haven't released the full breakdown of, of that analysis yet, but I will foreshadow now and say that the, um, the general uh, thrust of that analysis is the same, is that social media use in search, again, is consistently and significantly associated with more diverse use than not using those ways of access. Hmm. So, thank you. Thanks. Hi, I had a question about any behavioral dis differences you may have seen between the people who actively seek news out and those who more come across it on social media or elsewhere. And then if there are differences, is there a way to get that second group of people more engaged? Um, I'm really glad you asked that question. I think that's, in many ways, from my point of view, that's probably the part of the public that we should all think the most about in the sense that, frankly, the news and information needs of people like me are well tended to. Uh, there have never been a more privileged and spoiled group of media consumers in, the, in human history than people like me today. I'll be fine. Uh, but there is a question of a much larger part of the public who don't feel 
uh, motivated enough to seek out journalism as we know it today, but may come across it, incidentally, while doing other things on social media. Um, we are trying to drill more deeply into this because we are very interested in that question. We think it's very important, and we're particularly concerned about this issue that Eric also brought up of news avoidance, people who say that they actively avoid the news, asking them why and thinking about the ways in which they navigate news. Um, and I have to say that the, the findings around that are, I think, quite sobering for both for journalism and for the wider public and have much less to do with technology than one might imagine. Um, fundamentally, uh, a combination, our qualitative research in the UK would suggest of um, a very low opinion of journalism, seeing it as sensationalist, uh, crime-oriented, terrorist, alarmist, or superficial celebrity gossip material, which I personally don't think is a fair judgment of journalism in its totality, but I don't blame people for holding that view. I can find many examples that would confirm that view of journalism. Uh, so a, a, a sense of it as both irrelevant and depressing, which is not something that spurs much consumption, uh, combined with, uh, I think, a, a much deeper sense of um, disempowerment and alienation from uh, public affairs. A sense that since people like me, interviewees would say to us, can't do anything about all these terrible things we are told about in the news every day, why should we pay attention? How does that make my life better? How does it make my children's life better that I know that all sorts of terrible things are going on that I could no do nothing to change? So I think there are real issues that journalism need to confront there. And if journalism does that, I guess I am optimistic that um, the affordances of search and social and increasingly measuring and the like will actually help people who are not that motivated to engage with more of that content. But the content has to be there. And it can't only be the kind of journalism that presupposes that people are like me, that they follow it with the obsession of like a soap opera fanatic, and that I know all the characters and, all, and the drama and what was on yesterday, and that I can tell the difference between what Trump said this day and what Jeff Sessions said the other day and what John McCain said the day before and what this, that, and the other said. If that's always the premise, then you're always only going to be able to engage with the already engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a real issue now that we have to understand that publishers have to understand for the future of journalism as a profession and the future of their business, but one I think researchers can help to understand too and hopefully platform companies can help us um, begin to address those issues to ensure that the whole public is informed and not only, uh, again, those who are already engaged. Thank you. Um, let's take one more question. You wanna ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Hi, um, so first off, thank you for coming. Um, my question kind of relates to the proliferation of fake news. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, in terms of like search engines and social media, um, are news sites like Infowars.com, 70 News, things that sites that are known to publish just inaccurate information, um, do you feel or do you know if they've gotten, I guess, like a jump on like known trusted brands like the Washington Post, Guardian, BBC in terms of investing in things like SEO or partnerships with social media platforms and different things like that. Uh, thanks. So what a fantastic round of questions, by the way. Um, I think um, there are initiatives underway now, and Erica rightly highlighted some of the ones that Google are involved in, but there are a couple of different initiatives also by other players like First Draft Coalition working with tech companies as well as publishers to try to um, identify signals that could be machine read to address some of these issues around what kind of information surfaces. Um, I think that's incredibly important in part because um, I think the real head start that some sites have who are not always uh, equally committed to the idea of journalists being sort of find truth and report it or fact-based discourse um, is more that you can um, you can express your opinions about public affairs a hell of a lot faster than you can report on what actually happened. Mm. And as long as search and social privileges speed over almost any other signal, um, then there will inevitably be at least a period of time in which those who are brazen enough to simply say what they think has happened around some public event and promote it aggressively using SEO and SMO and so on and so forth, but it's just saying what they think happened. That will have at least a window where they dominate public discussion. Um, I think the, the broader issue is that in terms of um, 
there's much that can be done, and I'm glad to, to hear that much of it is underway and that, that people like yourself with a journalistic background are involved in this in addition to technologists who need to be part of solving this problem. Um, I think the, the next complication, I suppose, is that um, there are things that are demonstrably false and that are published with either with the intent of profiting from it or with the intent of influencing political processes, uh, whether it's state-backed propaganda or people who are very ideologically committed to a certain view of the world and do it as sort of activists, if you will. But I think there is a much broader set of issues that are more about partisanship, if you will, uh, than they are about um, f being fake or false. And that, I think, will be a hard engineering challenge, if you will. Um, I live in the UK. Um, the Guardian is a clearly opinionated news organization. Um, the Mail Online is a clearly opinionated news organization. They may publish things that some people find infuriating, that will be selective, that will be uh, partisan, that will interpret things, and perhaps even sort of push an argument to its outer boundaries, if you will. But they won't be fake. And it'll be very hard to think of a technical solution to adjudicating that information, or whether we even should want a technical solution to that. I personally believe that we want a robust exchange of views in public. What we don't want is to reward malicious uh, misinformation, which I, I think we have seen some of um, mm -hmm. in some countries. Mm -hmm. so, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Well, we're at the end. I want to just ask you, since we have you here, last question. Um, Next year, looking a year ahead, if you could look into your crystal ball, what do you think the headline will be? Um, what are you anticipating might change? And I mean, is there any anything you're thinking about right now? Uh, I mean, I think the issue of trust is, uh, is one we really want to try to bottom out. Um, and we'll do more research in that area. Um, and I have uh, taken some um, suggestions today from conversations here and, and from conversations with other publishers where I and mean, we are trying to understand better the flow of information in these more private environments like messaging apps and really trying to better track that. But of course, we are vulnerable to the issues that was uh, uh, issues that like the ones that were raised by an earlier question that at the end of the day, our ability to map this stuff relies on people actually telling us what they're what they're doing. So we have some ideas for next year, uh, and we will sort of try to pursue them at our modest best. And we also hope for more suggestions from people like yourself as, to, as well as uh, publishers and, and academics and researchers elsewhere who like us, are trying to understand what the hell is going on um, with news and information in this brave new world. So, Good. Thank you well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.